Yes, we are. Good evening. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome back. Today we have a special occasion because uh, we are uh, presenting the Italian translation of uh, the modernization, a future in the past, which we have been working on the, the last year. Uh, I say just two things about us. L'edizioni for those uh, who don't know L'edizioni, for those uh, who don't know us, is an independent academic publisher. We are based in Milan and we are focused on uh, humanities and uh, social science. We decided to publish the Italian translation of uh, the modernization, uh, the modernization of future in the past, with, uh, which became, uh, which became uh, the modernizzazione un futuro nel passato. We did it for two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, social science, uh, history, uh, anthropology, sociology are uh, the subject uh, we are uh, focused on. And uh, also we love when uh, a topic is uh, faced from uh, those points of view. And also because uh, we find that uh, the modernization is uh, an innovative category and we think uh, that it, uh, it is interesting. So we would like it uh, to, sh to spread uh, in the debate uh, for, the for the Italian audience. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jakob Rapkin and uh, Professor uh, Mikhail Minakov for uh, their time and uh, for, st uh, for staying with us uh, during this uh, presentation. So. Uh, just one thing uh, I need to, to remind, to explain. Uh, if uh, someone uh, wants to, to ask something, we have uh, two ways. If uh, you have uh, a Facebook account, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, write uh, your question uh, on the comment. If you don't have a Facebook account, you can uh, write an email to me the address is uh, redazione at ledizioni.it. I will uh, write also in the comment to, to remind uh, to you all. And uh, I will uh, read uh, both kind of questions in the comment and uh, by email and uh, put it on the debate. So now we can, uh, we can start it. And uh, Professor Rapkin, uh, I started with you. Uh, and the, what is the modernization from an historical point of view? And uh, also, can you outline the contours of this uh, phenomenon? Well, uh, demodernization is a concept uh, that at one point I thought I discovered, then later I found out that other people have uh, had noticed it before me. Uh, and uh, the it's based essentially, this project that produced the book is based on a graduate seminar that I had at the University of Montreal for several years and in which my students and myself, we tried to understand some of the phenomena that we, I had observed and many other people had observed uh, in the former Soviet Union. So we began with the former Soviet Union but then it expanded into Latin America and other countries and other places. What is it that I observed and that struck me as something very unusual? Uh, the Soviet Union, a relatively modern country with uh, educated manpower, quite a numerous uh, scientific manpower, with factories which produced their own airplanes and so on, uh, almost overnight turned into something else. Uh, medical doctors were selling beer in the streets, uh, factories were closing down. Uh, so it was something very, very unusual. And it struck me that it was, it's related with modernization, it's a sort of uh, reaction, a negative reaction to modernization. 
And I looked at this and my students and I looked at the theories of modernization that were common in the 1960s when the Soviet Union and the United States competed for uh, for the loyalty of the newly independent nations, particularly in Africa. And so they were all offering, the, both of them were offering recipes for modernization. So I looked at those recipes, which were pretty much similar, surprisingly. Uh, we were talking about developing a civic identity for people instead of tribal identity. We talked about uh, developing an educated manpower uh, reducing socioeconomic gaps so that society becomes stable and uh, there's a strong middle class that can support that uh, society. Improving health conditions, uh, health as a matter of right. Uh, and uh, that list was quite uh, impressive because it reflected what the United States and the Soviet Union were undertaking in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, uh, and at the same time, it also reflected the balance of power because uh, the existence of one system encouraged the other to behave in a certain way. Uh, as we all remember, for example, that uh, uh, the many of the social rights introduced in Western countries was done uh, in order to defang, to neutralize socialist and communist parties. Uh, so once the Soviet Union disappeared and the danger of socialism and communism disappeared with it, uh, we observed a certain return to pre-modern conditions. And we see today, for example, in the United States, you have uh, uh, the life expectancy is going down. Uh, uh, there is still a, a tremendous gap between the life expectancy of blacks and whites in the United States. Um, India enacted several uh, laws that disenfranchise Muslims to a large extent. Israel introduced uh, a law uh, a couple of years ago that officially makes Israel a state of the Jewish people around the world rather than its own citizens. Mm. Uh, so here we see a real, Ukraine of course is going through uh, uh, very tumultuous times with extreme nationalism, ethnic nationalism uh, being exhibited. Uh, so you see a number of countries now undergoing what I would call demodernization and that's what attracted my attention. Uh, these examples that I've just given you uh, could be developed. Unfortunately, there are quite a few of them elsewhere as well. Sorry, I forgot my microphone. Now, uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, uh, Professor Minakov, uh, and about uh, the modernization from a philosophical point of view, uh, in which way uh, it can explain uh, social change uh, in our time? Well, actually, philosophy looks at the sequence of times, at historical time, human time, and universal time, as different, uh, as different phenomena. However, in recent uh, theories, especially connected with what Professor Rapkin already mentioned, these theories of modernity, theories of modernization in 60s or in the beginning of 20th century, also those theories that were in 19th century, they all focused on a progress. There was a, an idea that there is a progress and modernity goes with the progress for, in a revolutionary way, in a more evolutionary way, but modernity needs new beginnings, needs revolutions as the period where everything is squeezed in a very small time when this new beginning, new start uh, is actually happening. And then uh, application of this new start to the social reality. And then in 20th century, we meet more and more, first of all, with the dark side of progress itself and 
two world wars were the result of, of the progress or what was happening after World War II with this nuclear arms race, for example. It's also a progress bringing the threat of, uh, of some sort of um, the life itself. So many thinkers, including philosophers, social thinkers, started looking for alternatives to the development and sometimes reverse development. And suddenly we, we can literally see how in 20th century together we, we have these thinkers who want to promote conservative revolution, reverse development, and the reverse development itself. It coincides. So I, I am not talking here about causes and sequences. I, uh, I'm talking about uh, correlations. So from philosophical point of view, demodernization is a phenomenon of reverse development where certain level of progress is being reconsidered by big or small uh, society or and this reconsidering can be of reactionary uh, nature and Professor Rapkin was uh, mentioning it, but it can also be manipulated. It can be also just it happened so so with the Soviet Union, it's a, a number of factors coming together. And if we go at a micro level, then we can suddenly see different uh, reactions, but also uh, causes, uh, deeper causes for going back. And to, to finish this uh, introductory note, I would like to say that demodernization is either movement to archaic, types of behavior, of society, of uh, communication, or to the earlier stages of modernity. So in a way, uh, if there is a war, like in Chechnya, there, there was a famous ethnologist, Tishkov, who was there, who was studying how society reacts to a local war. And then there he was describing literally return to archaic, or in other, in other cases, like in Georgia or in today's Ukraine, demodernization is also connected with uh, the conflicts, frozen conflict in, uh, in Georgia and not so uh, frozen conflict as in Ukraine, where demodernization is happening because of this and in connection with this. Or as, as we were saying, this manipulation, or it, it's mainly connected with external involvement look at Iraq, and in our book we discuss it many times, or look at uh, Palestine, which is also described in the book. I'll stop here and we can uh, continue later. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. And uh, go back to Professor Rapkin, and um, I ask uh, this question. Uh, in, uh, in the book, uh, uh, in this book, uh, many chapters uh, are about uh, the modernization in the West, uh, Central Asia, and uh, post-Soviet countries. Uh, we also have uh, examples from Africa, from Italy too, and uh, other parts of the world, but you focused uh, on uh, those areas. And could you give us uh, some examples of uh, the modernization in those parts of the world? And uh, are the lessons to be learned for the rest of the world? Um, well, I've given some examples, uh, and uh, in uh, the beginning of our book, I quote a colleague of mine from Tel Aviv University who happened to see last yesterday morning, <laughs> and I would like to quote uh, from him and then continue uh, on, on page 13 of the English edition. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I quote, we quote him saying, the crisis of secular ideologies in the face of capitalist globalism created an inviting atmosphere for the rise of so-called pre-modern identities, mm -hmm. mainly ethno-religious, but also ethno-biological. And even if these identities have yet to achieve total victory throughout the Western world, in other corners of the planet from Eastern Europe to the Third World, they have nonetheless chalked up considerable achievements. In Israel, due to the previous ethnocentric background, 
new old identities have become very popular, making way for a winning symbiosis of religion and strong ethno-nationalism. And I think we observe this in quite a few places in the world. Uh, uh, I think that Israel may be a, a leader, one of the leaders uh, in that sense, where you observe at the same time remarkable modernity, high-tech industry, uh, very educated manpower, and at the same time, uh, identities based on or legit political legitimation based on claims that we were here 2,000 years ago. You know, this kind of religious ethno-national uh, idea uh, really contrasts with the modern, modern outlook uh, that we expect from this level of education. But I would like to say that modernization and demodernization often accompany each other. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not one or the other. Rather, uh, if we look at important periods where when country modernized, such as the Industrial Revolution, for example, it was largely based on the availability of cheap cotton. And how come the cotton was so cheap? Well, if you remember, slaves were used to produce cheap cotton. Uh, another case of uh, very rapid modernization, uh, I'm talking about the Soviet Union of 1930s, was largely achieved through, uh, again, captive manpower, through enormous amount of people who worked free of charge in concentration camps. So you can see that on the one hand, uh, you have progress and movement ahead, uh, but it's based sometimes on uh, very archaic ways of managing society. Uh, so the period of 1960s, when I took the theories of modernization as an example, was a very special period, I think, because both uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were interested in uh, making themselves attractive to others. Mm. And they competed in being attractive. And they competed between themselves. As I mentioned, the New Deal was largely a way of sa saving capitalism from socialist and communist onslaught. Uh, and many of the progressive measures were, in fact, introduced in the world as a way of uh, diffusing, of weakening the attractiveness of socialism and communism. So what we observe now uh, is, uh, I think, a regression, uh, which is exemplified by the well-known uh, disparity between rich and poor in the world, which I think is unprecedented today. And that goes against those theories of modernization, quite obviously. Uh, so, and this is happening without any counterbalance. I think what is also interesting, and Mikhail was mentioning archaic motives, um, I think what is uh, today uh, we observe a kind of <clears throat> arcade behavior in uh, so-called uh, revolutions. Now, revolutions used to be based on theory. They used to have a pro positive program. Uh, they used to have, well, we want to have the nationalization of industry, for example. Uh, now, uh, revolutions are very different. We are tired of Mubarak, or we are tired of Lukashenko. <laughs> uh, we want someone else, but there's nothing <laughs> that people propose, and this is becoming very popular. See, it, it, so this is the kind of, I'd say, demodernizing discourse that has become uh, very, very common. And of course, uh, the past president of the United States was a good example of demodernizing discourse uh, a, a, during his mandate of four years. Uh, trying even to introduce some kind of a, 
uh, ethno-national identity in the United States, which is a real challenge, <laughs> but um, the, you know, trying to point that the, the danger comes from you know, the Chinese virus and when they insisted on calling it Chinese virus. Uh, so I think that uh, examples, unfortunately, are plentiful. Uh, and we have to be just this careful. This book offers us, a, a, I think, a set of um, tools, a set of analogies, I would say, uh, that enables us to see what exactly happens. And archaic you know, the demodernization, uh, of course, I didn't mention it, uh, was typical of uh, the National Socialist Germany, where you had a very sort of advanced technology very advanced, educated country, and an ideology that really were taking them back to you know, Middle Ages. Thank you, Professor. Very interesting. And um, Professor Minakov, uh, um, this, books, uh, this book uh, attempts uh, to distinguish between uh, short-term degradation and uh, enduring uh, consequences of uh, the modernization. Uh, can you give us some ex explanation and some examples? Yes, well, this short-term reaction, reaction to some events can provoke bigger or smaller groups of people to, to look for pre-modern or early modern solutions to existing problems. Uh, Yakov was mentioning uh, revolutions. Um, if we take the revolutionary attempt in Ukraine in 2014, you can see that it was inspired by this European, the so-called set of European values, in a way something that is full of emancipatory ideas. But reactions to the revolutionary event provoke certain crises, and these crises create a mechanism that uh, in certain areas, in certain sectors, lead to, uh, to reverse development, to demodernization. And here is this complexity. So in one, uh, some sectors, there's a progress being made, and in other sectors, you definitely see a very harsh uh, return to very archaic structures. But that's kind of one example. In our book, we have a description of Abruzzo case, when on micro level, within a, several communities, uh, there's an attempt of fast development of agriculture of certain companies that provoke local communities to isolate themselves. The value of family, the value of church, the value of tribal, in a way, the tribal values suddenly reappear and go, go hand in hand with, uh, uh, with the uh, economic development plans. So in a way, the, the attempt of, uh, of strategic development, of, of some progress, of some modernization at local level can provoke rather a different result. And uh, more enduring consequences of demodernization can be seen in many places. So uh, another chapter, a uh, marvelous one, is written uh, by a colleague from Chile archaeologist of contemporary, who describes the case when in certain region of Chile there were, there were certain, uh, the copper was found, the, the place where the excavation of these resources uh, could bring a lot of profit to local and international businesses. So within a decade, uh, this region developed into high-tech place with engineering, with a lot of uh, workers, high, highly skilled workers, with specific culture, urban culture, in, in the midst of Salva. And then, when the resource is basically exhausted, everyone's gone. And these ghost towns uh, are the place of the wilderness. It's not even archaic, it's wilderness returning into uh, the, the city. And then how the remaining group of people survive it? What kind of, what kind of uh, practices do they use to, to live, to make sense of living? And that's much more enduring. Or a phenomenon of retro-modernity, when 
a stable archaic structure and stable hypermodernity structure coexist. Another chapter from uh, this book is the Southern African Republic, where hypermodern, high-tech uh, urban centers of Johannesburg, for example, or Cape of Cape Town, coexist with tribal uh, structures, with the local kings, in terms of politics, when kings receive uh, budgetary payments in order to create a number of voters for the white man in Johannesburg. And then this cycle of self-support of, of archaic and hypermodern structures create this strange reality. And it's quite sustainable structure. It lives on for several decades already, so we can say it's enduring. But again, uh, the history of modernity is not that long for Western Europe, including Milano. Milano is one of the sources of modernization globally. Uh, from Milano, from London, from Paris, it's like five centuries ago. But for the rest of the planet, it's 19th century mainly, 20th century. And 20th century is the moment when modernization reaches uh, the, the point where this complexity of development starts undermining it. And uh, I would like to finish this with uh, reference to Shmuel Eisenstadt, who was working uh, well in uh, most of the time in Jerusalem and who created the theory of multiple modernities. And these multiple modernities are seen that every culture, so big or society, can have its own way of, in modernization, in, in making progress. However, if locally, originally, uh, this progress is undermining itself, as it was in, in Soviet Union, especially in the 30s, when this huge, fast uh, industrialization was also coinciding with recreation of slavery, of gulag type of slavery, or of kolkhoz, another type of slavery. So this kind of strange inventions which co combine modernist approach, this big corporation, big agricultural corporation, and both Stalin and uh, Trotsky were discussing what is the best way of organizing this agricultural big business. Uh, it ends up with some type of slavery, of non-freedom, of lack of emancipation from a human being. So these are these time lapses, time paradoxes that are not theoretical. They are part of practice, they're part of reality. Thank you. Now we have the, the first question arrived by mail, is uh, by Antonio. Uh, Antonio asked, uh, let, uh, let me read. Do you think that the financial capitalism is linked to the modernization in the Western world and uh, in which way? Who started? Jakob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do think that uh, financialization of the economy uh, is one of the uh, contemporary traits that spells out uh, demodernization of society. Uh, among other things, it uh, increases the, uh, the gap between uh, the wealthy and the poor, uh, but more importantly, it, it doesn't produce very much. So the, uh, there is a, a crisis that, if any, that is produced by, well, I, I said it doesn't produce very much, it does produce crisis. And, uh, and I think we have seen uh, several of them uh, with the result that the nature of governments as servants of capitalism becomes very clear. You know, they, I think uh, Marx even said at one point that the, the government serves as a trade union for capitalists. And I think uh, what we see now is, is really uh, very much in evidence. So financial capitalism that we observe today uh, is a product both of uh, sort of societal development, economic development, but also 
the, I would say, a very drastic decrease of political understanding in the population. And I was referring to these revolutions that don't have a program and that operate on really irrational, totally irrational basis. Uh, I think that today uh, there is very little in terms of rational discussion and rational analysis of our society. It's uh, rather than having this kind of rational debate and rational discourse, you have very emotional, uh, blaming, uh, uh, alternative facts, all kinds of things, but not uh, an awareness that used to exist among much broader masses than it exists today. Well, I endorse Yaakov's uh, idea, but I would say that this financial capitalism just adds another uh, source of uh, crisis, of um, incongruences within the capitalism that adds more crisis, makes them deeper, which provokes reactions and uh, adds to demodernizations in different societies or in different sectors. However, as we know from Marx to Schumpeter, that capitalism is itself is a source of permanent crisis, permanent contradictions. This uh, destructive creative force of capitalism is enforced by financial capitalism, but productive capitalism creates them as well. So let's, let's be realistic, even in Marxian way. Illusions, crises are part of uh, reality. So this false consciousness is part of the reality itself. And capitalism is moving ahead or backwards uh, through these uh, crises. It looks like uh, capitalism grows on them and it's not my, my observation i think it's an observation stemming from early 19th century yes yeah, so i agree with that uh, yeah, let's move on uh, i have a question for uh, both of you uh, because uh, you know italian edition uh, i said before was published in uh, 2021 one year after the coronavirus pandemic started uh, how do you describe uh, the modernity, the modernization trends uh, during the pandemic uh, and uh, maybe in the world of tomorrow? Um, well, I, I can begin if you like. Uh, uh, there was very clear distrust of science uh, that was exhibited by some political leaders and uh, became quite common in the population. Uh, I would say that this distrust of science is something unprecedented for the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, uh, so there is a loss of respect and reliance on, on the rational procedure of understanding nature. Uh, and this happened while, in fact, uh, this virus was identified and analyzed very fast and the vaccines were produced also remarkably fast. So that's one aspect. Another aspect, uh, when, when it started, some people said, well, we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all suffering from this virus. Well, I don't think we are. In, we were in the same boat. <laughs> there were very different boats. Uh, because, uh, well, I'll talk about Montreal, where I was at that time during, you know, we had people uh, living in poor neighborhoods who suffered a lot more from uh, COVID than, than the wealthy neighborhoods for a very simple reason, or several reasons. They have more cramped uh, living conditions, so there are more people living together, my density is higher. But also, uh, while uh, people in my environment and myself could work uh, by Zoom and uh, we didn't have to go anywhere, if you uh, are a menial worker, you have to go. So they were exposed to, 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 to contamination, to contagion. And uh, I think that the, uh, this pandemic 
revealed tremendous inequalities which were there to begin with. But it showed that it's literally a question of life and death. It's not a, it's not a question of having a bigger car or a smaller car. It's really drastic difference between life and death. So in that sense, I think that uh, uh, the reaction or well, some reactions to uh, to this pandemic uh, uh, were really appalling in terms of uh, demodernizing discourse, uh, some kind of a, a mystical approach, um, something which I wasn't terribly surprised, but it amplified. It became very, very clear. I think Bolsonaro in Brazil is a, is a very good example of this of this type. But he's not the only one. He's just perhaps more picturesque than most. Well, uh, I would I would like to stress here that this challenge of coronavirus was provoking provoking both emancipatory or progressive and regressive or demodernizing uh, beginnings in. Uh, in human communities. Here in Milano, I live in Aquabella, this middle class uh, area, and uh, I, I saw in, in my personal experience, it was rather solidarity and like self-support, uh, uh, respecting each other's dis di differences and distances. But in a way, uh, my, my experience here in this part of um, Milano was rather positive and this feeling of solidarity and friendly shooter was there. However, if we look at bigger picture, EU is acting in a very egoistic way. Yes, there's attempt to help the, the neighborhood of EU, but still it's very limited. And if you compare with the time and efforts that Brussels and nation states of uh, the core trying to control the vaccine and uh, vaccination it's incomparable with the rest of the world, with the global south, for example. It looks like the global south, in the best case scenario, will receive this generic vaccine from uh, less, let's call them less trusted laboratories and factories in China and uh, in India. And sometimes, like in the South African case, these vaccines will, will be returned to the producer. So this inequality exists uh, visibly and the core, the global core shows itself a very egoistic one. And UN, even though trying to balance this egoism, it's still uh, UN organization could have done better. And uh, on, the other, uh, on the other term, uh, in Italy, there's a wonderful, a very wise philosopher, uh, Agamben, Giorgio Agamben, who was long warning about this biopower, uh, biopolitics, which uh, a new, uh, or a hidden, let's put it this way, usually hidden uh, function of a government, of a state, uh, that starts treating, even in constitutional democracies, in the best democracies, like when government starts treating citizens as the herd, as biological population, and suddenly uh, governors get this uh, temptation to actually stay with uh, w w where they are. So it's so good to be paternalistic, to, to actually to have less checks and balances and to stay up, up over the people. And um, th this temptation seems to be working in Italy less so, but in, if you look at Central Asia, uh, the, the war denialists, uh, the, the dictators of Turkmenistan or Belarus who were denying existence of coronavirus. So even talk, at certain moment, even talking about uh, some uh, sanitary measures, it was impossible. So in a way, we also see how uh, coronavirus provokes in power structures certain temptations that can add to demodernization in contemporary world. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, we have another question. This is uh, from uh, Alessandra. 
how do you explain that uh, the modernization bites hard in uh, those lands where, uh, where the Western modernity arrived just uh, 30 years? I, I didn't get the question, sorry. Could you specify? Uh, I read it again. How do you explain that the modernization uh, strikes hard in uh, those lands where the Western modernity arrived just 30 years uh, ago. Mikhail, you want to start? Oh, please, Jacob. <laughs> For change. <laughs> well, uh, if we're talking about uh, Western countries like United States, look at the death toll. And of course, it's. Uh, it's just another sign and uh, the symptom uh, for, for a signal for uh, American policymakers, which is not the first one. Basically, United States do not have reliable public health system. They have wonderful health system for rich. They have uh, the, the, the source of innovation in medicine, source of innovation in um, in intradisciplinary areas between medicine and technology, it's there. However, when you have a simple flu, a, a light version of uh, coronavirus, most, well, the big portion of the population cannot get a normal uh, treatment, a timely treatment, which leads to uh, complications and bigger death toll. So in a way, uh, the, the contemporary uh, contemporary core, the Western core countries, they were not ready uh, for this kind of challenge. And United States among them uh, is probably the worst. And I'm sure that this time, uh, policymakers will need to come up with some rectifications. This 50, recent 50 to 60 years of corporate medicine in the United States can be revised. Otherwise, this, uh, this non-public health system or unpublic health system is actually the source of threat for, for this nation. But the other countries, like those who started transition 30 years ago, it's, it's in a strange situation. First of all, the remainings of Simashko system Simashko was a, one of the organizers, the epidemiological network organizers in Soviet Union, public health system, who also created this, uh, started this mass vaccination system. Uh, it seems to be working even today after liberalization and the de de decentralization uh, of the uh, health systems. Although uh, I, uh, I should also agree with the critiques who say that we don't have reliable statistics from the post-Soviet countries. So if the statistics is true, then we definitely see the trace of the old Soviet, uh, especially late Soviet public health system. But that's only if, Jakob. Yeah, well, actually, uh, uh, even beyond uh, the issue of statistics, uh, the leaders of, say, Russian uh, leaders were saying that thanks to the Soviet system that still survived, um, they managed to contain and uh, actually have a relatively good record of uh, uh, preventing the spread of the virus. Uh, and I think it shows that in spite of the neoliberal nature of Russian regime, which is very clear, and uh, uh, various attempts at uh, privatizing medicine, medicine and making it look more like American one. They created very sort of fashionable clinics for the wealthy and all of that, but it somehow didn't succeed in destroying the public health system. So some of these vestiges turned out to be very useful, as Mikhail was saying. In countries that embraced modernity in the, 30, in the last 30 years, I've been thinking, I just don't know any. Uh, I think the modernization in, say, in Africa began, well, 
independent African nations began, I would say, in 1960s, not because if you took a look at the 19th, in the last 30 years, honestly, in most of those countries, there was regression, there was destruction of public health, destruction of public property, uh, privatization of whatever could be privatized. Uh, so I don't know what uh, Alessandra meant, what kind of countries uh, she meant. If she oh. specified, that would be nice to know. Well, maybe it's about Italy, because uh, Milano, it's the, the center of uh, Italy. Sorry, uh, people from Rome, but uh, as Milanese, I, I think uh, Milano is the most develop, uh, developed area, at least in technologically and from the point of view of public health. However, it's definitely was not developing in the right way, at least to uh, respond to challenges like it is. So in a way, those generations, and it's late 60s, early 70s, who invented public health system in Italy, and th those were very brave and smart people. The, the, the after them, the generation of neoliberals have definitely made a, a big di damage and probably rebalancing. So the, the challenge to the current policymakers in Italy is to create strong national system and uh, one region, one province, uh, public health systems cannot save the nation for the challenges like this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, one, uh, one last question, if, uh, uh, if anyone uh, uh, doesn't write to us uh, again. Well, uh, um, The modernization shows us uh, the other side of uh, modernity. Do you think that uh, studying the modernization and uh, modernity's uh, consequences may show us uh, to improve uh, human development and uh, to arrive maybe tomorrow or something like a well-tempered modernity? <laughs> well, uh, one should be optimistic, but uh you also have to realize that the modern systems, uh, including public health, incidentally, uh, I, I repeat what I said in the very beginning, but I'm just giving you an example of uh, the beginnings of the public health system in Germany. Uh, the, it was introduced by uh, von Bismarck, hardly a socialist, but he was threatened by socialists and he part of their program. <clears throat> so what I think is essential is to have a balance of power. Today, I see in geopolitical terms, there are some attempts at creating a balance of power. We, we will see how it goes. But within Western societies, and not only Western, uh, I would say within you know, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Central Asian societies, there is no balance of power. There is, unions have been destroyed. Uh, it's really free reign for capitalists, essentially. Free reign for the public sector. And, and what we observe is a steady transfer of wealth from the public sector to the private sector. Uh, it's done by fiscal policies, it's done like in the former Soviet Union by a strange kind of privatization um, that uh, in, in Russian they have a word for that like combining privatization with grabbing privatization uh, but uh, I think that today we we, we have very in my opinion uh, we have to recreate somehow this balance of power within societies because there is a lot of discontent, uh, but discontent doesn't create a positive program. And I think the, the movement in Spain a few years ago, indignados, you know, indignado is kind of nice. If you step on my toe, I'll be indignado, but <laughs> it's not a positive reaction. I don't, I don't produce anything. And unfortunately, um, it has been a tremendous success 
for those who introduced conservative revolution from 1970s, uh, it was a success in economic terms because the wealthy have become much wealthier. It was also a success in ideological terms because they really disarmed all opposition. Uh, and what you have today, you have procedural democracy in many countries, even with established democratic regimes. But essentially, you choose between someone with blue eyes and brown eyes. Uh, their programs don't differ very much. And if you don't have this freedom of choice, democracy becomes procedural, ritual. Uh, and uh, so I think it's very, very important to have a balance of power within society where you have options. Well, uh, well-tempered modernity sounds a nice uh, concept. Uh, and the balance is a nice concept. But it looks like the, the disbalances may help us to progress or may, may cause this regression. And, uh, well, modern society, modern culture as such, is created by several simple steps. One of them is... Differenti uh, differentiations of uh, public and private sphere. So in a way, return to the balance between public interest and private interest is very important. 30 years ago, when the hegemony of Washingtonian consensus or the so-called neoliberal approach started, like, uh, be be became dominant over other types of um, uh, visionaries, it, it, was, uh, it was definitely ruining this balance between the private and the public. But also, it's already, it has nothing to do with neoliberalism, uh, that uh, contemporary, the modern society is connected with society and the modern individual. So education, rights, freedom, the, the values that make our lives sensible, they were also uh, under strike. This irrationality of values was definitely visible. The displease of uh, majorities of populations uh, with co contemporary democracy, ritualistic democracy, is in the place. And in Italy as well, look at the Five Stars, Lega Nord, uh, all these kind of movements, they're popular. And when you go, I, I did it myself as a philosopher, I believe in talking to people. And I went to a, a meeting with voters of different uh, party candidates, and I was listening what people were asking in the last elections. It was, what, three, four years ago? And uh, I was surprised that the, the same people that once voted for Socialist or Communist Party in Italy, so 30, 40 years ago, they were very progressive, let's put it this way, Today, their major concerns were these uh, guys, migrants, who are staying in the streets and asking for Europe. And this turn, the, 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 the disappearance of solidarity, disappearance of progressive uh, imaginary, imagination, social imagination, creates a, a, a huge threat for modernity as such. However, I would like to uh, finish my... Uh, my speech with the words of Habermas. Yes, modernity has uh, a lot of bad sides, dark sides. It, it is full of uh, reverse developments and uh, these other types of uh, progress. However, modernity has its uh, po uh, positive opportunity. And while modernity is still going on, we may actually see the best of it. I think it's a, it's a good conclusion. Uh, so, uh, uh, we haven't uh, any other question. So, I would like to thank uh, Professor Minakov and Professor Rapkin for their time. I would like to thank uh, our audience uh, and uh, two questions. Uh, it's, uh, it's good for a presentation. I think that uh, spread knowledge uh, can be a way for uh, the human develops. So 
uh, let's do it uh, also with publishing books and uh, talking about that. Thank you very much and thank you. Uh, good evening. And thank, thank you, you for translating our book. <laughs> yes. Sir.